welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Jared Franklin of Gunfighter Customs. Gunfighter is a company I discovered for myself at Blade Show this year, drawn in by their decidedly exotic, tactical, and carryable fixed blade knives. After talking with Jared and his table mates for a few minutes, it became obvious that Gunfighter's aggressive designs are backed by their maker's military pedigree and combat experience. Gunfighter Customs truly live up to their name, custom making knives designed by customers in addition to their standard catalog offerings. We'll meet Jared and find out about Gunfighter Customs, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and uh, share the show with a friend. Also, if you wanna help support the show, you can do so by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon and seeing what we have to offer. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Shockwave Tactical Torch is your ultimate self-defense companion featuring a powerful LED bulb that lasts 100,000 hours, a super-sharp, crenulated bezel, and a built-in stun gun delivering 4.5 million volts. Don't settle for ordinary. Choose the Shockwave Tactical Torch, theknifejunkie.com slash shockwave. Jared, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. It's very nice to have you, sir. Hi, Bob. Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Oh yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, so, uh, funny thing, um, someone recently, very recently, <clears throat> uh, reached out to me and asked if I knew of anyone who makes custom knives uh, to customer designs. And you're the first one that popped into my head. And he said, "Oh, I have a couple by them." Um, and uh, I will tell really? you afterward. Yeah, I'll tell you afterward who that is. Uh, I don't remember right now, but I have it in my email. And I thought that was that was cool because that was one of the first things. I learned about you um, uh, is that you do that. We'll get to that in a second because I think that's uh, that's something in short supply out there. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who would love to see uh, what they imagine uh, come out in, in someone else's knives. But before we get to that, let me ask uh, you about you. Uh, how did you get into knives? Well, um, I, I kind of was born into it a little bit. Um, my dad is a custom knife maker and um, he's been making knives for 50 some odd years. So, uh, you know, growing up around it, I would, um, you know, I would always see the finished products of his knives. Um, and of course those drew me in. And um, when you, when you grow up with a knife maker, you're, you're uh, bound to be interested in it. And that's definitely how I got my interest in knives. And I've been, you know, I, I had a knife in my hand as, as soon as I was old enough to, to walk into the woods. So it's uh, it's been a lifelong uh, passion of mine. What kind of uh, knives does your father make and what's his name? We'll plug him right here. Yeah, uh, his name is Michael Franklin and he has made knives under hog knives and Franklin made knives. So that those are both him. Um, and he makes anything from, you know, fixed blade tactical to uh, big showy bowies, you know, fancy, uh, pretty materials. And he also makes folders. Um, he's done a little bit of it all. Um, he's even made uh, custom autos and stuff like that. Some some really interesting stuff. Hog knives and Franklin made. I am definitely going to have to check him out. Uh, so you said... Uh, from the moment you could walk into the woods, you had a knife in your hand. What were you carrying? Was this something your dad made or uh, did you, was it the case knife handed down by the grandpa? Well, it's uh, the, the knife that really drew me in and got me for good was this knife right here that I've got. Uh, my, my dad carried it in the glove box of his truck. And um I remember it was 1992 because he was getting married to my stepmom, and uh, for whatever reason, I I thought that he should give me a wedding present. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know how that happened, but I had in mind that I was going to uh, try to get him to give me this knife. You know, so that's how I I found my way into this knife, um, and this is uh, an, an old school bayonet. 
that he uh, did some custom work onto, made some saw teeth on. And, you know, as a eight year old kid, this was, you know, really awesome. So this was the knife I had on me at, at most times. And then from this, I would go from uh, a lot of cold steel. I would do cold steel machetes and the, uh, the one they marketed as a throwing knife that you could wrap the handle with paracord. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's got a ring. It's like a ring dagger. <clears throat> uh, no, not that one. It, yeah. True flight. It was the true flight thrower. I think was what it was called. It was a little beefier. And uh, like I said, it didn't come with scales. So you could, you could wrap paracord around it. Uh, and I, I beat the, the ever loving tar out of that knife. And um, as far as I know, it's still around somewhere. I just don't know where. Uh, that that bayonet you just showed with the sort of uh, Rambo style um, th or, or Lyle style serrations on the back and the in the camo paint that is a really cool <clears> knife. <throat> I could see uh, that sparking an interest. Um, I mean, I know your interest was strong even before that, but that's the kind of knife that every uh, young boy dreams of having. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, I thought I was, you know, Rambo with this knife as a little kid. So it was the, the coolest thing in the world to me. And, you know, my dad gave it to me. So it made it even more special. Yeah. Uh, so how you you served in the U.S. Uh, Marine Corps. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. Um, I served from 02 to 06. <clears throat> and then um, I took a brief stint to go to college uh, from 06 to 08 then i re-enlisted and uh did four more years oh wow thank you for your service uh definitely uh, man N not only the first time but then going back my lord yeah you're you're most welcome man i um uh, i realized i'd made a mistake i uh i missed it too much and uh you know with, with everything still going on i wanted to to get back in there so uh, i'm glad i did it i'm really glad uh i've uh uh um, my in-laws, a lot of, um, Marines and, and very close friends. And then a lot of knife makers, uh, that I've had on the show, uh, are, are Marines. It, it's really a, a vocation, a trade, uh, an art form that attracts Marines. It's pretty interesting. Uh, what do you think that's about? Uh, <clears throat> Marines love weapons and, um, uh, especially knives because, uh, you know, on on the base, we're we're not allowed to uh, have in possession our own personal firearms, but we we can have our our, our blades, albeit you know that they, they have their rules on that about what size of knives you can have in the barracks and whatnot. But for the most part, you can you can have your knives, um, and they're readily available on base. You can go to the the PX and and buy a K bar. So you know mm -hmm. that's that's perfect. Yeah, uh, I, I think there's something uh, about Marines, too, and the um, uh, just from my outsider's perspective, the uh, spirit of adaptability um, just kind of matches with a knife. A knife is kind of a do everything kind of tool uh, as well as a weapon. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I, it, it makes sense to me that Marines uh, tend to be drawn towards it. So when you were serving, uh, what what did you carry and and how did you use knives uh, in the military when i was serving uh, most of the time i had one of my dad's knives on me uh, i would carry uh, one of his folders and then anytime we went to the field and especially when i was deployed in iraq i had a big tactical fighter um, strapped to a thigh rig on my leg so it, it was a pretty serious knife uh, it had a eight inch blade um, it was a pretty nasty Pretty nasty knife, but um, and you know, and as far as using knives in the field, uh, man, we, we we could use them from anything from you know cutting down and clearing bush and trees to dig a fighting hole or opening MREs, which is, to be honest, the the main use of a knife in the field is, I would say, per capita, you know, uh, opening MREs, but. Uh, there's always stuff that has to be open. There's always stuff that needs to be cut. And, sorry about that. <laughs> <Got> no <it. problem. laughs> 
got an intruder. Uh, <laughs> but there's always stuff that needs to be open. There's always things that need to be cut down. Uh, so you're always going to find somebody with a knife in their hand. Uh, yeah. Especially in the Marines. As a guy who grew up in the eighties uh, on a steady diet of Arnold Schwarzenegger and, uh, and S Sylvester Stallone uh, and a lot of other movies like knives were huge in eighties movies. I was under the, uh, the impression that that was like uh, the secondary weapon of every, you know, everyone in combat. And then I've realized as I've gotten older and spoken to people uh, really it's used for mundane purposes. And a lot of, um, you know, prying things and that, and that kind of thing. So a knife, better be strong. Um, do you, do you think that your military service, uh, or, or let me ask you this, how did your military service, um, inspire your designs? And let's talk about your design philosophy and what you think a good knife is. All right. Well, with, um, with being a Marine, you know, you're, you're always going to have that, that fighting spirit and, uh, it's always in the back of your mind, um, combat, you know, uh, what happens if uh, I get attacked and I'm out at, at the store or whatever? So those kind of things come into your mind when you're designing even just a, a little EDC knife. Um, uh, my de design philosophy is I, I want something, if, if at all possible, that I can use in everyday tasks and uh, to defend myself if need be. Um, and if, if I can use it in the woods uh, with a little bit of bushcraft or whatnot, even better. So I, I try to bring as much of all three of that into each knife as I can. Uh, you know, I, I intend for my knives to be used heavily and often. So, and that's uh, why I use really good materials because I, I want people to use their knives and use them hard. Uh, you know, we, we see what we want to see course uh i i did not think uh bushcraft or outdoors at all when i was looking at your at your knives but now that i think about it uh, i'm thinking of the one that looked kind <clears throat> of bar uh, barong shaped and it has has a little notch on top and a, on the thumb rest that one uh, to me looked very very tactical when i saw it but now that i think about it that that could be a great sort of field knife Yes, that you're you're uh, you're talking about the EPIT model, uh, which I don't happen to have one on me at the moment. But yes, that knife. Um, one of my my close friends has one. He got the very first one ever made, and um, it, like you said, it doesn't look like a utilitarian type of knife. But he carries it to work every day, and he works. Uh, he's, he does construction and, and stuff like that, and he says he uses it every day. So, I mean, I, I've seen him open paint cans with it, uh, just all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. So I, I, when I, when I pick up a knife, just it's due to my interest, not my lifestyle. Uh, but when I pick up a knife, I'm always thinking first of its uh, capabilities as a weapon. Um, and when I look at a knife, that's also how, how I evaluate it. And when I came to your table, I saw that knife and I saw another knife that I can, that I saw, uh, on your Instagram a lot and man, it's very cool. And I'm not sure what it's called, uh, but it has a handle that sort of encapsulates uh, bookends uh, the handle. And, and then, and then it has a uh, sort of a Persian -y blade that sometimes is double edged. What is that? Um, that one is called the Murdoch. And uh, that's another one of Mike Elliott's designs. He's my lead designer and, uh, you know, partner for uh, lack of a better term. Um, that's, uh, probably one of my favorite designs he's ever done. Um, but yeah, that, that thing is a beast. It's, uh, and even it has, uh, some utilitarian, uh, uses as well. You could, you could take that thing out and use the crap out of it. Yeah, no doubt. So we're, uh, scrolling through your Instagram here. I see a, a gununting. I see some push daggers and then, uh, field knives and all, all sorts of, uh, things here. Now, uh, something I mentioned up front uh, when I say things here, I mean different kinds of designs. Um, uh, when I was uh, talking about you up front, I, I mentioned your custom knife uh, making. Like you have your own designs, and then you also have um, 
people, you know, anyone, I could come to you with a design and, and ask you to make it. Uh, how, do, how does that work uh, in comparison with making your own designs? Well, um, generally, uh, if, if someone wants a, a, a knife or a design done by me, I, I'm real easy to get a hold of. You just message me directly and show me your design. And <clears throat> if if you don't feel like your design is, is uh, as good as you want it to be, you can just give me a little sketch and give me the general idea of what you want to do and I'll take it and refine it and, you know, show it back to you and see if this, you know, is this what you want or, you know, if it's not, I'll, I'll change this or that and we can go back and forth until we get it right. And then, you know, then I'll, I'll knock it out. Uh, do you ever make those, uh, if someone comes to you with a design and other people are interested, do you, uh, work something out and make those for other people too, or is this just a private label, uh, private thing? Yeah. Usually when, when, when people send me a design that they want made, they'll say, you know, if any, you know, if anybody else likes this, go ahead and do it. But if they don't, I'll ask, you know, if someone else wants one, I'll say, you know, is it all right if I make your knife again? And, and nine times out of 10, they're, they're okay with it. So, and that's happened. I don't know how many times I've, I've had a lot of knives go out like that. Well, I, I love it. I have, uh, had, like, I'm sure a lot of uh, people like myself, enthusiasts and collectors, have sketchbooks full of designs they'd love to see, or um, you know, drawing in all of the in the in the margins of your notepads and stuff. Uh, so it's exciting to know that someone can actually uh, take your designs and turn them into something uh, something real. Uh, okay, so you told us your design philosophy is sort of like it has to be EDCable and useful for the kind of things you always use it for, uh, but also at 7-Eleven at uh, 3 a.m. it has to be able to show up if someone is trying to mug you uh, or something like that. So that's kind of your philosophy. What's your what's your design process? Are you a, a CAD guy or do you sit down with a pencil and paper? <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pretty old school when it comes to those kind of things. Uh, if I get an idea that pops into my head, I'll just try to find a clean piece of paper and I'll get my ruler and a pencil and I, you know, sit down and, and try to draw it out. That's a, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so you're one of these guys, uh, you're like a sculptor at heart. You have the steel and you really, uh, you might have a general idea, but you kind of uh, discover it as you're making it. Yes, sir. And, um, you know, if I, put it on steel and I cut it out and I don't really like it, you know, sometimes I might just change it as I go. You know, I, uh, I have a pretty good eye when it comes to that kind of thing. And, uh, if, if I have something that I don't think looks right, I can generally get it to where I'm happy with it. Okay. So how, how do you make them? Uh, tell us your process there. All right. I, uh, you know, I, I make my template out of either Kydex or, uh, like, in cardboard and um, I'll trace that onto my steel and I've got a uh, just a, a regular angle grinder with a, a metal cutting wheel and I clamp my bar of steel to a to a, a table and I just go to go to town I just cut it cut it out right there all by hand all right, and then and then what then I take it over to the grinder and rough it out and uh, now I've got a, uh, a grinder that goes horizontal. So I've got one of the new fancy grinders with a, a VFD and everything. Those are, so, oh, wait, what's, um, the, what's the VFD? What is that? It, oh, very the, variable. The okay. Yes, the, the speed control. So yeah. uh, and, and that's new. You know, up until last year, I didn't have any of that kind of stuff. I just had a, a homemade <clears throat> two by 72 and a two by 48. And that was it. But, um, you know, that's, that's the new baby in the shop. So I'm pretty happy with that. But yeah, I, I, I just grind it to shape and um, get it to where I'm happy with it. Plot my holes, drill them, and then uh, do my my jimping and whatnot. <clears throat> and then I'll start on the, the flats, get those to where they're, you know, a good 120, 220. And uh, then it's ready for heat treat. Okay, so you, you do your bevels before heat treat. Um, I, I, I 
always am interested back and forth. Uh, not, I shouldn't say back and forth. Some people do it like you and other people do it after heat treat. I think oftentimes it depends on the kind of knife they're making. Uh, maybe uh, I know kitchen yeah. knives. You don't want to, you don't want to bevel oh, first because no. they're so darn thin. Um, uh, but no, no sorry. Me, I, I was, uh, I, I was talking about the, the flats, not the actual bevels. Uh, you know what I mean? So just the, just the flat part of the knife. So oh, I, I grind, I grind my bevels in after the heat treat. You do. Okay. I was going to say it yeah, always, yeah. it always makes sense for me, for me as a, as a, someone who doesn't make knives to do it when it's still soft, but yeah, I, I, it, it seems to make sense if you can manage and you can afford all the belts to do it afterward. Uh, so it's, you're not getting warpage. I, I like to do it that way. It's um, it's more forgiving that way. Uh, if you, if you take a brand new uh, 60 grit belt and, you know, get up there with your soft steel, you're uh, in my experience, you can take away too much material too quickly and um you might end up you know ruining a blade or whatnot um and then there's the the issue of, of warpage if you you know if you grind your your blade all the way down to where you need it uh as thin as you need it it's a, a lot more likely to warp than it is if it if it weren't ground so that's just the way that uh i was taught and that's the way i do it so it seems to work pretty well so what was it like going uh, from your handmade or your homemade um, single speed grinder to the variable speed grinder with the horizontal features? Oh, man, it, it was uh, it, well, I was like a kid on Christmas, to be to be honest with you. It, um, I had used grinders with a speed control before, but they were never mine. And it was just once in a blue moon. And but but every time I got the opportunity to, I was like, man. This is so cool. I have to have one of these one day. Um, it just it took me a lot longer than than I had planned to get one, but we've got it now, and uh, I'm I'm really happy with it. I couldn't be happier. So, what's your setup like? Um, it's, I can't remember the name of the manufacturer, but I bought a a frame off of USAKnifeMaker.com, mm -hmm. and uh, so it it's it was pretty well already assembled. So basically you took it out of the box and, and put the, the frame onto the stand. And then I bought my motor and, uh, speed controller from, uh, Whitmer, uh, Whitmer power supply, I believe, uh, they're on eBay. And I think I bought off their website though. And so, uh, I got the motor and the speed controller and, uh, attached the, the motor to the frame and and uh, wired it all up uh so it wasn't like a like a whole package deal that i that i bought that kind of pieced it together on my own i love that uh i i think i think i would be um uh, what do you call it uh predisposed to just buy the whole thing um but i know that that's way more expensive and i think there's something right. really cool about about putting together a grinder i know a lot of people have have built them um, from the ground up. And uh, I think there's something cool about that. Um, when I was asking about the setup, I, I, what I, I meant to be more specific, what is your shop like? Like, tell us what your, what your working environment and your shop is like. I got you. Um, well, up until just uh, two years ago, I didn't have a shop. So I would work out of my dad's basement where his shop is at. And I had just a table outside of my house and I would carry all my machines out there, set them up, work outside and then bring them all back in uh, when I was done. And I did that for um, almost five years. Uh, and then we, we moved to Kentucky in 2022 and uh I, I told my fiance the only way that I was going to buy a house is if it had a shop already on it. Like I didn't want to have to build one, I, you know, and it didn't matter what kind of building it was, as long as it had electricity, it was going to work. Uh, and so that's what I've got. I've got a, uh, a, a pretty decent sized, uh, just basically a little workshop and I've got, uh, let's see, I've got two, two by 72 grinders and, a two by 48 
with the, the eight inch uh, contact wheel conversion on it. So it's a mm. two by 48, but a regular bench grinder. Um, I've got the Harbor Freight mini mill that I do my jimping and stuff on and uh, a drill press and a bandsaw and uh, a kiln. And that's it. That's that's the shop. And and that's it sounds like that's all you need. I'm I'm sure there's I'm sure you have a, a list of things that you'd oh, like yeah. to get. But but what you're talking about, um the um lugging stuff out, machines out, working <clears throat> outside, bringing it in back and forth for five years, that's that's real dedication. And it's also a good uh example to people who and I might consider myself uh, in this category from time to time, <coughs> pardon me, who put barriers in their own way um, and and blame it on, well, I don't have the right machines. I don't have the perfect setup shop, uh, no ventilation. So I uh, can't do it. Well, you can always bring it outside. Well, you know, mm-hmm. um, so, and, and, and that is in no way to um, criticize people who do that because I do that also. But it, it also goes to show if it's important enough, you do do that. And, and you don't, even think about it i mean every time you might be like oh this is such a pain i can't wait till one day but the fact is you're still doing it um have you always been someone who's been creative and uh like a a hands-on kind of builder type person that you'd be kind of willing to go through all this to make knives on the daily uh yeah i've always been uh better at artistic type things than say athletic type things uh you know i wasn't a sports star or anything like that but you know i did play sports but i wasn't that good but um i I always drew and and stuff like that um and i always loved building stuff with my hands uh i was in workshop in high school i loved building uh anything really um but as far as art and building stuff goes i think knives is where uh, my main interest is with with that kind of stuff so uh, i'm I'm always happy if i get to to work on knives i uh, i I would do it nonstop every day pretty much yeah uh some people uh i think you're probably one of these and i am with my own things but some people aren't happy unless they've got their uh, creative pursuits going and and uh, sometimes it 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 starts small but it uh a small deviation over time uh, becomes a huge one and and if you if you have the interest in doing something and making something and creating something uh you know don't don't let the lack of a sweet shop that's already set up yeah. uh, uh stop you yeah i mean uh, people will tell me all the time they would see me outside at night in the winter you know i'm i'm wearing full bibs and uh, a face mask and just freezing to death but i had a knife that needed to be made so that that the cold the rain nothing nothing was going to stop me so uh, i don't know I, looking back on it now it, it uh, I, I'm glad that it was that way. I'm I'm happy that I went through that because it, it makes me appreciate what I've got now uh, so much more. Oh yeah. Uh, w- was your dad, um, your father, who um, was a is a custom knife maker? Was he your main teacher, your main mentor, or did you uh, <clears throat> pick up pick up others along the way? Yeah, for for the most part, it was my dad and. Um, then once uh, once I had gotten out of the Marines, I started uh, going to work with Sean Kendrick. Um, oh my was, gosh, love his work. Yeah, right. Yes. Uh, so I was I was beyond lucky on that. Um, I just happened to live right down the road from him, and he knew my dad. Uh, that's uh, he he actually went uh, and and sought some some tutelage from my dad when he got his start in knife making, and so. I think I was like 12 years old at that point when I met Sean. And um, so naturally when I got out of the Marines, I, I went to see him and I, 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 I don't think I had seen his work in maybe 10 or so years. And I was just blown away at how far he'd come. And so uh, 
we would hang out and work on weekends and stuff. And I've learned a lot of stuff from him and, and he's helped me out a, a great deal along the way. So between him and my dad, uh, I've got the, the, you know, the, the best mentors that anyone could ask for. Yeah. I mean, uh, really, uh, a great uh, two, two people that you can draw a knife making information from technique, that kind of stuff. But, uh, us outside of them, what about knife inspiration? Like who are the people out there, the designers, the makers out there that you admire, uh, that, that, uh, that, that also keep you going heroes outside of your own circle. Hmm. Let's see. Inspirations. Um, I, I like a lot of knives. There's just so many new makers and new companies out there. It's hard to keep track of. And, uh, I, I always go back to Microtech one way or the other. I like oh, their yeah. knives a lot. So yeah. um, I would say I draw some inspiration from them. Uh, let's see. Um, I, and again, I, I'm kind of old school, man. So I, I think back and uh, I like Eck knives. Oh, I, yeah. I like, yeah, I like Randall knives. I like Jimmy Lyle's knives. Um, so a lot of my inspirations were you know, older generation makers. Um, Do you remember I, Entrek knives? Entrek? Entrek. It sounds yeah. familiar, but I can't picture it. They were kind of like Topps knives before before Topps knives. They were, they were pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I too like the old school makers and, um, uh, you know, tend to go for that sort of uh, combat-y, militaristic Look, we're we're okay. We're flipping through your Instagram. Do you have any knives in person that we could see? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I saw the the scroll going through there, and uh, man, I need to update my social media. I'm really <laughs> awful about that. Uh, a lot of that stuff is really old, but but uh, no worries. Let's see this one. I think you saw this one at Blade, Bob. This is yeah. the EDC Tactical in uh, Magna Cut. Uh, I really like this model and this is good for, you know, just everyday type stuff and self-defense. Wow. Yeah. This is hard to do <laughs> Yeah, with the backwards. So that is that swedge ground uh, for double edge if you wanted to. Yes. That's an option on this blade. This one is ground to where it could be sharpened. I just didn't sharpen it. So if, if someone bought this knife, I would give them the option of me sharpening it or leaving it the way it is. Um, I think that's a, a cool option to have. And these are really cool with the, with the double edge, you know, it's really nice for the call grip. Yeah. That's a beauty. Uh, I, I really like the, uh, the overall utility look of that knife, but with that bayonet swedge, uh, that's pretty wicked. What's that one called? This one is just called the EDC tactical. EDC tactical. Now you mentioned this is in Magna Cut. Uh, uh, is is Magna Cut a steel you you particularly like to work in, uh, or uh, you know, tell tell me about the materials that that really get you going. Yeah, I'm, I have uh, worked with Magna Cut ever since it came out, and I've I've really enjoyed working with it. I like it a lot. I think it's a great material. Um, I, I haven't had anybody say, hey, you know, this this knife in Magna Cut is dull or broke or anything like that. So I have no complaints out of it at all. I think it's a great steal. And, uh, uh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Uh, um, a, a lot of uh, 3V. I use a lot of 3V. Um, let's see. I use some uh, crew wear. I like crew wear as well. Uh, you know, the, the, the tough steals, they're really where I like to stay. Tough steels, super high end steels, and uh, yeah, Magna Cut. Uh, my Magna Cut in my collection is growing, and and I, uh, I'm really liking it uh, from a user's perspective, a super light mm -hmm. user's perspective. I have to be 100 percent honest, but uh, uh, I still like it. Um, uh, I was going to ask you uh, with the with the EDC Tactical, if you could hold that up again, uh, real quick. Sure. Um, so we all know, and, and I am an EDC uh, uh, carrier. EDC -er of fixed blades and uh, this one by the way looks uh, awesome for that that role uh, but 
a big part of it is the sheath. Uh, show us the sheaths and and tell right. us a little bit about about this because that's oh yeah. So, this is just your standard black Kydex sheath. Uh, this one doesn't have a belt clip on it, but uh, I always give the the customer an option of do you want to wear it in waistband or on waistband or uh, what position do you want to wear it in? So I that's that's usually the last thing I do is put the belt clip on. Uh, and so this one's just ready, waiting for a home. But, uh, you know, just a regular black Kydex sheath. And I make those as well. It's probably my least favorite part about my packing. <laughs> but they have to have a sheath. Yeah. So, That's not the first have. time I've heard that. But what I love about this, hold that up again, please, if you will. Uh, is that you can get a 100% full grip on that knife uh, with the way the sheath is made, pull it out and have right. it not have to readjust one iota. Right, right. Yep. And, you know, it's got a, a little thumb ramp here, so it kind of gives you some purchase on the sheath to pull it out with. Yeah. I like that EDC tactical. So you've got the Misfits uh, skull as your as your logo. Yes, sir. Um, I've always been a big fan of the Misfits and uh, the old uh, Marilyn Monroe movies, like the the Crimson Ghost. That's oh. where uh, that's where the skull came from. Is uh, oh. an old, old movie, okay. and that's and uh, Danzig was obsessed with Marilyn Monroe, and I think you know that's that's kind of why they chose that as their logo. I think so. I couldn't say what what Danzig. Uh, what was going through his mind, but I'm glad he did it. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, uh, behind you on that coffin, that looks uh, it looks really cool. Uh, let us let us see a couple of other models. Do you have other right. other stuff of yours? Yeah, absolutely. I've got this one. This is a, a prototype called the Close Quarters Dagger. Uh, I believe you saw this one at Blade too, Bob. Yep. And this one is CPM Crew Wear with. Uh, uh, black and red marbled carbon fiber and it's got a two-tone finish it's double ground double edge and we're at about uh 140 thousandths on the thickness so a little bit thicker than an eight it's got a really nice shape to the handle so yeah it's got that know, coke like bottle a, yes yes and uh up here on the 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 top i can't get that to show up but it's it's jumped up there as well yep we can for, see that. for your reverse grip that is uh, oh yeah i like this one a lot i do too uh i'm sorry don't put it away yet <laughs> let's see oh, okay. i want to look at those bevels so you did this uh this is all freehand grinding Yes, I uh, you know I don't I don't use any jigs or anything like that. I uh, I was just taught to grind freehand, and that's just the way I do it. But uh, Man, those grinds look perfect. That is so beautiful. And you know we're looking at four four be you know four perfectly uh, yes. matching bevels at least from my view here. Uh, yeah, they're they're um, you know probably within a thousandth or two thousandths of each other and. This is one of the the hardest blades for me to do uh, as, a, as a double edged dagger because of that, you know, getting everything lined up. But uh, you know yeah, what I I'm like about this it. this blade? I keep interrupting you, man. I'm sorry. No, uh, no. I, I I see a dagger. I get excited. Uh, so what I really like about this blade is that it, it it looks pretty small, like three and a half inches or three inches, something like that. But it's yep. so wide that uh, you know you that w that width of the blade really maximizes any sort of uh, you know puncture you're going to do with it, or mm -hmm. any sort of thrust. Uh, you're just yeah. going to get maximum damage out of that, and uh, or maximum effect, let's say, out of that. And right, yes, I, I love that. It, it reminds me of uh, uh, of the Italian cinque dia, you know, with the really wide blade that looks like a pizza slice almost, but yeah. it has that same yeah. effect. Uh, like a little big knife. That was kind of the idea behind this one was the, you know, the mechanical advantage of this short, fat, pointy blade uh, was for it to be nice and strong and stout. But like you said, it's going to make a pretty gnarly puncture wound. Uh, and, you know, could be very useful if you needed to 
you know, dig a hole in the ground or something like that. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, and as far as the blade being short, it's, uh, you know, if you're in close, you don't want a super long blade. You're going to, you know, maybe want something a little shorter, more maneuverable. Yeah. Uh, not to not get caught or, or, you know, bang on something. But yeah, th that was the, the whole purpose for, for this knife was, uh, close quarters type stuff. I think people think, uh, you know, in, in an era where there aren't too many knife fights, I guess, uh, compared to the rest of history, uh, people think of duels, you know, that's not a fighting knife. It's too small. Like, no, 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 we're not, yeah. we're not, uh, we're not squaring off, uh, squaring up at dawn where mm -hmm. this is someone jumping on you and, and you can just barely yeah. get this thing out of the sheath. Well, if it's seven, eight, nine inches, it's, you know, going to be a lot harder to remove and to get in where you need it to go. Yep, absolutely. And th like you said, that was uh, that was my thinking on this one. I keep put, I keep trying to put it away. Yeah, don't you don't have to. Yeah, it's really nice. Uh, uh, so, do you do big combat, uh, bigger combat things? I know I've seen a lot of the, and what really uh, what really gets me are the small things that I know I could carry on me all the time. Yeah, but I also love and collect larger you know combat and field knives what do you do in in that sort of realm well uh like i said in in the beginning i, I love making stuff for edc but that that's not all i do i mean i've made some ridiculously big knives I, did you see the ganooting that i had at blake yes i did yes okay. and we saw that when we were scrolling through the instagram okay cool um i've actually got uh this dagger that i just finished up and Ooh. this is this is a seven inch uh, double edge, double ground dagger that I just finished up for a buddy of mine's wife. And this is going to be her wow. first knife from, from me. That but is yeah. so cool. That is beautiful. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I this, love this that. One, I uh, love that this dagger has a uh, um, uh, finger choils. Uh, you can kind of wrap your finger around the the uh, guard. Mm -hmm. That is nice, right? And th this grip is uh, really positive. I don't, you know, it would take a lot to get this out of your hand, and it just feels really good. So I wanted to add that option in there, um, you know, and it it looks really cool too, and it it gives you an opportunity to to make your guards, uh, you know, nice and even and away from your cutting edge so I, I like the way it came together is this something uh that will that is a regular model or will become one uh this is actually the very first one and uh it it will be available for order if anybody wanted one yeah i could see that going like gangbusters uh, what's the blade length you said uh it's it's seven inches i think I'm pretty sure seven inches and the overall length on it is 12. Now this one is uh, it has a very pretty and beautiful sort of purple pine cone handle. Is that pine cone? Yes, uh, and and these were chosen by uh, by uh, my buddy's wife herself, and I ordered them and and put them on for. Her. That's very so, cool, and uh, you know you could also see this with like green micarta or something. It looks oh, like yeah, it looks like a classic combat knife. Right, right. It, it, if I made one for myself, you know, I'd probably maybe do, like you said, some, some micarta or carbon fiber and maybe a, a darker finish and etched finish maybe. So how long have you been, uh, how long have you been at gunfighter customs? How long has this been a business for you? Um, let's see. I, I want to say we started in late 2017, uh, and then things kind of got going more in 2018. Um, so it, it's been longer than I think, like for me, it, it's, it's only been a couple of years, but it's been reality. It's been more like six years. So I would say about six years, um, I've been making under gunfighter customs. And, uh, w w what has been your, uh, well, uh, before I ask you that gunfighter customs, obviously, uh, not knife fighter customs are, is the name referring to your, uh, military past? Yes, and in the beginning, um, and really still, I'm mainly making knives for, for veterans. And um, so 
my thought was uh, I'm making knives for all these gunfighters. Why not call it Gunfighter Customs? And um, that that name seems to uh, seems to uh, go along well with the veteran community, and they kind of get it, so it works. So, what about running a small business and 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 uh, oh, I like what you're turning in your hand. We're gonna look at that in a second, but uh, well, let me ask All you. Right. What it what it's like running? No, 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 hold it in your hand. Don't put it down. What it's like running a small business in knives? Is this uh is what what what's the what's that world like? Um, man, it, it's not easy. It's uh, it's it's hectic. It's stressful. Um, with the the materials I use, I I spend a lot of money, so there's not an awful lot of profit. Um, and you know, at this point, it's just uh basically paying the bills you know i'm uh yeah it 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 gets tight from from time to time but uh i've i've been able to have enough business to uh pay the bills and you know put food in the kids mouths so i you know i can't complain one bit that's that's uh, that's amazing that's what i was um hoping to hear because uh, not only are you know were you showing a good example in you know, lugging your stuff out for five years and being devoted to that. But uh, this also shows how that pays off. You're, you're, that's your living. And, right. and that's awesome. Um, okay. Enough of my philosophizing. Let me see this. This looks amazing. Okay. Double edge. Let's, let's hear about this. Uh, this one is the gunfighter model. And this one is another one of Mike Elliott's designs. That's actually Mike Elliott's logo right here. You see the ME. Uh, this one is in M390 and is a chisel grind. Uh, and I've got black sheer touch D10 with red G10 liner. Uh, let's see, we've got jimping going up the thumb ramp and then on the, the downside as well. And then some here in the belly of the handle. So you've got a, a really nice grip on this thing. And it is really small really compact really light and it, it's not coming out of your hand yeah that thing is <laughs> that, super cool yes and the, it is wicked uh, especially these these thin ones with the chisel grind man these yeah. things are just like scalpels uh if you look at it wrong it'll cut you this knife reminds me of a very uh of one that got away from the old days of cold steel, the Desperado. Do you remember the Desperado? It had an egg egg shaped handle, but a Vaquero blade. And man, they discontinued that in the early two thousands. And I've always regretted that. Hmm. Uh, the blade is obviously nothing like that, but the spirit of it, that, that handle buries in there. There's no way anyone who knows what they're doing could possibly leverage that out of your hand. There's no exposed pommel or any, any extra room. And then, and then what protrudes from the from the fist is this gnarly pointed double edge, uh, uh, with the point incidentally reaching out uh, right where it needs to be for a back fist. Um, right. Yeah, that is amazing. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. This, this thing is uh, definitely one of my top five uh, models that we do. Uh, I just love this. Uh, what's it called again? Because I the, th this is this gonna get me in called, trouble. This one is called the Gunfighter, um, and this one was designed to be used in conjunction with your pistol. So you would have this in your offhand, and you you know draw your pistol with your strong hand, and then if your, your pistol runs dry or malfunctions or whatnot, you can go to this in your your uh, left hand or whichever hand your off hand or you can actually use it with your pistol if you want to you, know, you awesome. have it ready in your hand uh, anything else you can show us oh uh, let's see I've wow. got a brand new model uh, this one we are calling the the Reaper and this is another Mike Elliott design and this one, Ooh. Uh, if you can see here. Whoa. So the sharp edge is here where, you know, you would probably think it was going to be on this side. But 
this one is meant for like pulling towards you so like this mm -hmm. yeah that 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 uh pick call sort of edge in right right and then in traditional grip you're gonna be right here with your and the you know the the front edge is sharp and then here's your live edge and then this side is not sharp so it's for that that old heave ho they they used to teach in uh the marine corps and the army with the with the k-bar with the edge up you know yep. uh when you have it in, in uh, forward grip uh edge up you jam it in pull it up mm -hmm. yeah yep. wow that's pretty wicked that's a very unique looking blade uh I, I i really dig that it's sort of a tanto i mean it is a, it is a tanto it's just uh a tip down edge in uh style tanto what's this is called the reaper you say yes um it, like you said, I, I can't think of a knife that I know of that has a blade shape like this. Yeah. So I'm I'm pretty stoked about this one. And this is the the very first one that I've ever done. And I just finished it that I just finished it up yesterday so that I could have it for tonight. Oh nice. Yeah. Oh nice. Oh well let's see the handle. And so the handle is kind of like the Murdoch you were talking about, where it yeah. kind of encap encapsulates your your finger there. And you've got some jimping up here, so you're you're going to get a really nice solid grip, and the retention on this thing is uh, is top notch. Uh, it and the uh, and the um, other knife you mentioned, I, I'm such a space cadet. What what did you say the other name was called? The other knife, the Murdoch. Yeah, this and the Murdoch. Uh, have very Filipino style handles. I mean, I'm looking at some of the knives back here behind me with the with the, the overall curve in the handle and then the extra hook mm -hmm. and the bird's beak and the pinky choil and all that. <clears throat> yes. Um, you know, Mike is big into uh, PTK and I've done some training myself in PTK. So a, a lot of the, right. Yeah. So a lot of the blades you're going to see are, are uh, inspired by, by that kind of thinking and, um, you know, fighting for them. Hence, hence the gununting that I saw at Blade Show. That was so cool. Right. The gununting is the big uh, curved sickle shaped sword that it's not that big actually. Uh, that they use in the the special marines use it in the south, and they they're still fighting. They're still engaging people uh, with uh, blades, which is pretty pretty amazing. What do you what do you see as the future of gunfighter uh, customs? Like how how would you like to see uh, the company um, uh, exist over time? I uh, I'm planning to this year. I've got some some big blades, like big in size blades that I've got to get finished up. And as soon as that is done, I'm going to make a make another folder. So we're gonna try to break into folders, and um, maybe even possibly do some some laser cut blanks for my fixed blades. You know, get big big orders of those if if need be. But um, what I'd really like to do is just is keep doing what I'm doing now, uh, just to uh, a bigger base of, of people, of customers. Um, I'm, I'm not real sure that I want to get huge and, and do all the, the CNC stuff and, uh, get into all that kind of stuff. That's just not really what I'm, uh, what I'm thinking about doing. I, it, it could happen if, if need be, I guess, but that's not really where uh, where my head's at with it. I kind of like to stay, you know, hands on mm -hmm. and 100 percent handmade. Yeah, it seems like that's uh, a huge uh, a central aspect to, to Gunfighter Customs is the handmade aspect and the one right. by one aspect The the idea of having uh, blanks uh, cut out water jet or laser cut. I think that's just efficiency. That doesn't take away from, uh, from from any of it being handmade. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that that's uh, you know that's what part of what the charm of your knives are. You can, um, you know, the the fact that they're uh, so tactical, kind of you know, uh, but yet so uh, uh, not doted over, but they're very uh, beautifully made. I guess I should say so yeah. kind of, uh, you know, you can imagine the ugly purpose, but they're beautiful works. Yes. 
Uh, what uh, what is your fantasy? Wait, no, no. What were you gonna say first? Uh, I I like to say that uh, my knives are are also art. You know, not not just a knife, but I I like to think that this is my form of art. Yeah, yeah, and you can you can see it in the in the finish work. I mean, whether or not you designed it, uh, you know, you can tell in the making of it and in the execution what i was going to ask you uh, i got uh, I, I cut myself off in, at a weird moment what i was going to say is what is your fantasy blade to make like what is the thing that you would love to make a sword or or something man that's a that's a good question i would hmm. uh, for myself or to sell uh for yourself and and there there are no limits in terms of like you don't have a big enough kiln to heat treat or anything like that don't worry about that okay. we'll take care of it well i've been thinking about that and i would think that if i had to make a knife for myself it would be the the tertia which is the ganunting i've i've wanted one of those ever since i made the first one it is it's just absolutely cool i mean when you see it in real life like you know i mean it, it's it's just impressive and uh and it, it has a lot of utilitarian uh use yeah um and i like to go camping and, and stuff like that so it would it'd be right there with me cutting down trees and, and doing that kind of stuff and and you know i can train with it all that kind of good stuff cutting down trees and scaring the bears away yeah yeah well, uh, Jared, it's been really nice talking to you, with you and catching up with you. And uh, I'm, 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 I love all the designs I've seen, but just seeing the gunfighter you just had out uh, looks like, uh, man, that's a sweet knife. I, I really love the look of that. And it looks so easy to carry. Some people are um, intimidated by carrying fixed blade knives, uh, but the knife you were just showing off, uh, the gunfighter, just hold it up before I let you go real quick so people can see it again. Um, yes, sir. With that small, short, curved handle. Uh, if you carry in the waistband, that's going to be so kind on your love handles, believe me. And uh, just yeah. small, pocketable. Of course, it's uh, an aggressive design. You could use it that way, but also it would make a great EDC. So, oh, absolutely. Uh, this thing is perfect for opening Amazon packages and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. It's a little honey. All right. Well, thanks so much, uh, Jared, for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, we will talk to you soon. I can't wait to get one of your knives in hand and show it off to the world. Man, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, It's been an honor. It's my pleasure. Take care, sir. Thank you. Adventure Delivered, your monthly subscription for hand-picked outdoor, survival, EDC, and other cool gear from our expert team of outdoor professionals thenifejunkie.com slash battle box. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Jared Franklin of Gunfighter Customs. Uh, go to his uh, Instagram page, Gunfighter Customs, and pour over those pictures. Uh, they're awesome. Uh, it's really cool to see one-off knife designs as well as uh, the recurring um, the recurring models in their different treatments that gunfighter is a little honey that just captured captured my heart all right be sure to join us on sunday for another great conversation thursday night for thursday night live uh thursday night knives our live stream and wednesday for the midweek supplemental for jim working his magic behind the switcher i'm bob demarco saying until next time don't take dull for an answer Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.